I would say that I was fairly active most of my life. Built this house, and I'm a woodcutter and splitter, and I work in my shop on automobiles. Lifestyle habits changed. I kind of retired fairly early, and I didn't have a lot of hobbies or projects going that I needed, and I found myself just sitting a lot and not being active. Around 50, I started gaining some weight, and then toward the mid-60s, I got quite heavy, about 250 pounds. Pretty much all my adult life, I've had acid reflux. Of course, early on, they didn't call it that. They said heartburn, heartburn. Holidays, of course, or special days, any time of the year. The turkeys and the gravies and all of the dishes with onions and great salads and alcohol bother a great deal because it's a lot of acid you're putting into your stomach. And, of course, you overeat and fall asleep. So, and that's not a particularly good thing to have happen. Like millions of Americans, Jack self-medicated with over-the-counter antacids. His symptoms went away and he thought he was free of acid reflux, until his doctor made an alarming discovery. I was in and uh, had an, uh, an e-scope uh, and the doctor discovered that I had Barrett's disease. If that lining of the esophagus is burned away by acid reflux, the body, in some cases, will replace the normal lining of the esophagus by the type of lining that we find in the intestine. So when the normal esophageal lining is replaced with intestinal lining, that is given the name Barrett's uh, mucosa, or Barrett's esophagus. When Barrett's esophagus is left untreated, it can lead to a type of esophageal cancer called adenocarcinoma, this is a serious condition which is growing at an alarming rate. The incidence of esophageal adenocarcinoma has increased by a startling 350% over the last decade, making it the most rapidly increasing malignancy among white males. For many patients diagnosed with esophageal cancer, their best treatment option is an esophagectomy, removal of their esophagus. The University of Michigan is a national leader in the development of an operation to remove the cancerous portion of the esophagus and reconnect the stomach using a less invasive approach than that originally used. The procedure that we have uh, developed and refined here at the University of Michigan is called a trans-hiatal esophagectomy, where the abdomen is opened, the stomach is freed up from the attachments that hold it there, and then the surgeon reaches up through the opening in the diaphragm through which the esophagus passes on its way to join the stomach, frees up the esophagus working from the bottom up, makes a separate two-inch incision on the left side of the neck, gets around the esophagus uh, up in the neck and reaching down from above and up from below, the esophagus is removed and the stomach is brought up through the same position in the chest where the esophagus used to be all the way up to the neck and is connected to the esophagus up here in the neck. This month we've finished our 3,000th transhiatal esophagectomy. It's an enormous operative experience with, with one procedure, but it is, is unquestionably uh, placed us in, uh, among the, uh, the, the highest uh, volume centers doing this work. Nationally, esophagectomy is one of the operations that has been identified as being a procedure in which volume performed is exceedingly important in predicting the outcome of the operation. I had the total esophagectomy uh, done about 15 months ago, and I'm doing great now. I've lost about 70 pounds, which of course, you get a whole new wardrobe. <laughs> and. Um, I have lots of energy and I feel very good.